My name is Chrissy Caggiano, and I work in the admissions department here. We are going to um, be meeting with some wonderful lecturers for the program today, so we're very happy to have you, and we will have opportunity for Q&A. So I will now hand it over to our program director, Teresa Chan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us. I know it's a beautiful day outside, and you'd probably much rather be somewhere else. Um, I am really pleased to have with me three of the lecturers in our insurance management program. Um, and I, I myself teach as well, but I think today we like to focus on the three guests that we have, and I'd like to introduce them. It's Robert Procopo, and this is in the order uh, in which I see them on the screen. So nothing in particular, no, uh, no particular standard. Um, Ken Radigan, as well as Marguerite DiMartino. So welcome to the three of you, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about each of our lecturers. Um, they, all of their bios are actually on the website, so feel free to uh, go to the website and take a look at their bios as well. And you'll also notice that we've done something um, a little bit different, and we really wanted to make sure that you understand that we are about building community. So if you want to reach out to any of our lecturers, their email addresses are actually on the website as well. So please feel free to reach out to them, as some of you, uh, I see some of you here have. Um, and, you know, and talk to them about, you know, what your interests are, your concerns, um, and, you know, anything about their courses, um, and make sure that, you know, you're, you're comfortable with them. So with that, I want to start with a little bit of a bio on, on each of them. Um, Ken Radigan teaches the insurance risk management uh, course for our master's program. He's the chief risk officer for the New York State Insurance Fund. And prior to this, um, Ken served as the CEO of the Professional Risk Managers International Association. Um, he also served as the risk off, chief risk officer for the U.S. and Bermuda platforms for Aspen. Prior to Aspen, Ken was the CRO for the Casualty and Global Risk Solutions divisions of AIG, and he worked for AIG for over 25 years in a variety of roles. Well, something that I find really interesting about Ken is that Ken was the inventor of two U.S. patents on nuclear decommissioning insurance, um, and his background is major in mathematics. Um, while he also earned a number of insurance designations. He was recently named the recipient of the Qualified Risk Director designation from the DCRO Institute. So we welcome Ken to our conversation. Bob teaches our role of finance and insurance course based on his 45 plus years in the banking and insurance industry. He is now retired, but working as an energy finance consultant for private companies, including the development of innovative insurance solutions to help facilitate financing. He has also been an advisor to members of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives and their energy committees. After years in banking, Bob transition, transitioned to insurance as a project finance advisor for AIU Energy and in joining AIG High Star Capital LP as a partner. AIG High Star was a private equity fund managed by AIG with a focus on power gen, transportation, and environmental service. He is also a member of the Nuclear Innovation Alliance in conjunction with Harvard and MIT. So we welcome Bob as well. And last but certainly not least, Marguerite DiMartino. She has incorporated her experience as VP of SCORE Reinsurance Company, where she assists in overseeing the Technical Accounting and Administration Unit into her course operations, the backbone of the company. Previously, she was the Global Operations Director at American International Group as well. Throughout her career, Marguerite has honed her ability to direct global operations for enterprise-wide initiatives business improvements, organizational transformation, and process re-engineering. She's also managed complex operational issues worldwide, evaluated business needs that drive technology solutions, and launched multiple process improvement projects as a result. Marguerite holds certifications for ARM, ARM, Six Sigma Master Black Belt, and New York City Office of Emergency Management, Emergency Manager. She also spent 28 years with the U.S. Coast Guard Reserve, retiring as a public affairs senior chief petty officer. So with that introduction, um, I'd like to say hello to everyone and welcome to our discussion today. So first, um, I'd like to, to mention that all of our lecturers come with many years of experience and as some of you have seen over 300 plus years um, you know, through, throughout our careers. So it's really important to understand that our courses are actually built on that experience, not only the technicalities of the subject matter. 
So um, I want to ask first of all of our, our lecturers to tell us about the main objectives that you want to achieve um, with respect to the content that you're teaching in your course and how you think it benefits the students in their day-to-day -day work. So any of you could raise your hand to start first. Bob, you want to start? Oh, or oh, Marguerite, Marguerite, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I think the benefits in the, uh, in the course that I'm, I'm going to be teaching uh, gives the students the opportunity to understand what the back office operations is all about and the critical role it plays in the business, in our industry. And um, having the opportunity to lecture on a subject that I believe is way overlooked in the industry um, and, you know, using this as a way of using my way of sharing my background and my experience and uh, just being able to give people an opportunity to understand what goes on in the back office and how important it is to the industry. Um, we touch all areas, core and both the core and support functions within the industry. And, and of course, involving the back office. And what we basically do is encourage class engagement. My particular course has a lot of group activities where we have teams work together for a number of modules throughout the course. And um, the other thing is too, you know, we do, we focus on problem-based learning. And I find this is very helpful when we're working with teams and coming up and so with solutions and things like that. Uh, and what happens during the course is we, we it's very thought provoking. It, we utilize a lot of tools. We utilize a lot of ways of building things. And then we come up to the end of building an operational playbook, which is really important. And I have a lot of guest speakers that I've had. And um, one of the most important things, of course, is to, you know, the collaboration. And I want the course to be enjoyable and be and, and the students to know that I'm available whenever, in addition to office hours. Um, I think that's basically it. Oh, that's that's actually a lot. So oh, I'm sorry. Did I go? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's that's great. Bob. Ah, my turn. The role of financial insurance. Most people just don't even tie the two together. Uh, when I first thought about insurance, I thought it would be boring. And fortunately, with my background in finance and trying to understand the insurance industry. I've had a ball in my 15 year career at, a at AIG. Uh, very rarely were you ever micromanaged. In my case, it was never micromanaged. And it got to a point when there were problems any place in the world, it's send Bob and I had a ball doing it. But the objective of the course, what I wanna to try to accomplish here is I wanna give the students enough of a background in the financial side of the house, whether it's the investment portfolio, it's the impact that insurance will have on their uh, ability to raise financing for individual projects. Uh, it's worked out well. I've had students come back to me and say, now if they sit down and they're in a, in a meeting with senior management and the topic of finance comes up, they don't shy away from it anymore. They're not gonna lead the conversation. This is not an MBA program. But they're able to get into that conversation, hold their own, and actually take things away from it. We've had students come up with uh, financial wrinkles that allow uh, insurance to happen, that allowed financing to happen, and it's worked out really well. Uh, the fact that this is at a graduate level, we were not we are not as grade conscious. The students are very grade conscious, but there's no games. We're not playing games. We're not trying to play gotcha. We want the students to walk away with a background that really gives them the comfort to move up. And if you plan on moving, unless you're already there into middle and senior level management, having this background is certainly going to help you get up to the levels that you aspire to. Uh, We'll teach you about risk profiling. We'll teach you how to look at an insurance situation or a financing situation and parse it out, understand all the risks. We'll teach you what it takes to have a project that's ready to be insured, have a project that's ready to be financed. Uh, none of this should be scary to anybody. We will answer any questions. We'll work with you if, uh, I don't know what else to say. 
Well, there's actually a lot to say, but you know, since we only have 20 <laughs> minutes, we'll we'll wait for some other time. Ken. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, so I teach insurance risk management. Uh, risk management is a relatively young but quickly evolving field, especially within the insurance industry. Uh, just about every financial crisis that we've been through, you know, when we take a look at it after the fact, we realize that there's things that we probably could have done better. And my role is to try to help people understand what role does risk management play within the insurance uh, company. And certain people may be interested in getting into risk management themselves, but other people, you know, maybe they're working in claims and underwriting and management and legal and operations, whatever it may be. But it's important to understand what role risk management has and how that enhances the value of the company. So again, it's an idea of looking at, you know, what, what were historical mistakes that may have been made uh, the current banking crisis that we're having, you know, a lot of people look at that and say it was an asset liability mismatch, you know, that it there's things that they should have done uh, that could have avoided the liquidity crunch that they had. And again, it's making sure that people understand this uh, going forward. Go ahead, Teresa. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, like I said, there's so much to say, so I don't actually know when you guys want to stop talking about it. We could probably do this for a whole hour if we had the time. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to move on next then. And I know, and then and the precursor to this is, I know that when I asked my lecturers to teach, um, the first thing I told them were, that was, was that it was online and they were like, oh, okay. Um, and then I told them it was asynchronous. And then I think, you know, the eyes widened and they said, hmm, what's that all about? So this next question is actually really relevant to that. Um, you know, because we, you know, even I myself, I, I met this challenge with some hesitance. So has the format worked out for you as a lecturer? And what are some of the educational benefits that you see in the format? You know, whether it's group work, projects, discussion prompts, et cetera, notwithstanding the fact that it is a great modality for working professionals. So I'll, I'll start with that. So, so uh, to be honest, it was probably the one thing about the program that scared me the most. Uh, I taught before in a classroom setting. And what I teach is can be technical in nature. And it's very important to see the feedback. You know, you can be lecturing on a topic, but you need to see the student's face. You need to see their expression. Are they understanding what you have? Uh, at Columbia, you know, we want to make sure that the program has a certain quality. So we're required to pre-record every single lecture that you have prior to the class actually beginning. And you're not getting that feedback until the class actually starts. But I was very encouraged that, you know, through the use of the discussion prompts, through the group projects, you actually interact a lot more with the students than I had anticipated. And you get to see them, you know, and see where they're struggling, where they may be uh, understanding what you're saying. So it worked out much better than I anticipated. And it was the part that I was, you know, the most uh, fearful of. I'll jump in next. My biggest concern was the lack of interface where you've got everybody in one room at the same time and you, each person can feed off the next. And as we got into it and we had more and more office hours, we had more and more presentations that the individual students did, found that it worked out very well and people were more inclined to put a bigger effort into these individual methods of communication. It uh, we there because we've got people with big egos. Occasionally, you ran into disputes, and I think it was a lot easier to resolve dis disputes, glitches, get people a higher level of understanding to accomplish what they try to accomplish by having one-on-one -on -one sessions when they were necessary. And in my midterm project, it's a group project, and I have each of the groups, depending on how big the class is. Each of those groups make presentations to me with each individual making a presentation on their section of that particular project. And that really improved the dialogue. The office hours were a good way to follow up and the discussion prompts kept things moving and moving very quickly and in detail. Uh, Margaret, it's all yours. Yeah, I think the pandemic really, when we all went 100% remote, really pushed us into this whole remote asynchronous type of uh, learning. And I think it really was a great 
beginner way of getting used to doing this type of work. In the beginning, yes, it was like, oh, how are we going to do this? But I'll tell you, it was a challenge, but I really enjoyed it. And I think right now with the cohort that we have now, it's just incredible with the discussion prompts and how people are working together and using various technologies to stay to get, you know, other than the technologies that we offer through Columbia, they use WhatsApp app, they use things to stay in touch. We have people that take the lead as for the for the cohort and keep them communicate with them all the time. And my office hours, I get participants all the time. And, uh, you know, we just don't talk about you know, what the deliverables are and, what to dis and discussions about what the module we are covering for that particular week. We talk about everything and anything. So it's actually been very, very good. And it's as, as, as we go on, Teresa and everybody, it's, it's, I've gotten much more comfortable with everything now. It really is, really is a lot better. And, and I think if you folks if, who are listening, um, if you are very used to remote work, this, it, this is really, the best thing. And it's actually, you know, being able to work on your own time is very important because you're all full, full time workers. I work full time. And, but I'm still, I always say to my cohort, this is my CU side, this is my work side. So I have my computer set up and I'm being, I'm able to watch everything. Yeah, I wanted to bring up that a point that was made about the discussion prompts um, versus sitting in a classroom. And I think both Ken and Bob alluded to this. Um, you know, when you're sitting in a classroom, you know, you're sitting in a lecture hall with, you know, 300, 300 of your closest friends, and there's a lot of pressure, right, for you to participate. Or even if you're sitting in a seminar and it's 25, 30 people, there's a lot more pressure to participate um, because maybe something that you just heard hasn't registered yet, right? And you haven't had the chance to digest it yet. But with the discussion prompts, the way we run them, everyone has time to think about what they've learned, to think about the lectures, the readings, and therefore, the discussions, which kind of fill in for that classroom discussion, are actually much more rich. I think the content, I think what we've all seen across the content is that it's much more rich because our students have had a chance to actually think about it. And then the pressure to you know, raise your hand during class is alleviated because everyone has the opportunity to participate through our discussion prompts. So I think that that's one thing that you know we were pleasantly surprised about in terms of building relationships, getting to know each other, and like Ken said, to really know what's going on in the students' minds. Because, you know, in a classroom setting, you don't know until there's an exam, you don't know until, you know, there's a project that's due, but here we know all along the way from week to week. So um, it's a great relationship building um, uh, 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 format, um, and it's also a great learning format, we found. So and also the group the activities, you know, yes. are great. So team building type format. Yeah, I mean, our students, if you talk to any of our alumni and you talk to any of our current students, they are so very personally invested in this that they make every effort to get to know each other, to work with each other, as well as to socialize with each other. Um, so it's really, I can't even begin to describe how, in fact, our students came together after um, you know, starting during the pandemic, and they saw each other for the first time after 16 months of being in the program together. And yet when they came together, they were hugging, they were greeting each other, they were like old friends, and they had never met in person before. And then, uh, you know, when we had our first in-person residency last summer, the new students came together, and they, they gelled right away. They, they met each other, they saw each other, they enjoyed each other's company for three days, and now they have since, you know, launched into the program. And I hear that they're doing a lot of things, academic and non-academic together as well. Um, so, you know, business trips, when they go on business trips, they come together to meet each other. That's the kind of community we're trying to build. The other thing that's really important is all of these lecturers, including those who are not on, are committed to being in connection with you, not just for the duration of their courses, but for the duration of their program and beyond. So I think that the value of the program is not just in the academics, but also in those relationships that you get to build with each other, as well as with us. So yeah, well, in the interest I, of, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Teresa. I was just gonna add something to what you said, but go ahead. Please do. Oh, uh, your unique Columbia email address, your uni, survives way beyond the program. Mm -hmm. So basically, as long as we're still alive, 
uh, you can always get in touch with us. And we've had students come back to us that they want to come up with an insurance idea. Can we help them with it? We've had people come back to us with business plans and a group of us would get together that can add something to it and help them flesh out a business plan. Uh, it, it, it's, it's an amazing situation, the way that this has been set up. And a lot of that is to Teresa's credit because of the group of people she pulled together and the way we all work together. But it's, I, I guess I'm jumping into the next question. And the next question was, how was our experience? Or into well, you know what? Go for it. My, my next question was, describe your experience with the students. And the, what do you ex- enjoy most about you know, their, your interactions with them? Getting to know the students, getting to understand their aspirations, getting to help them achieve their objectives, uh, being in contact with them. They'll come up with every, every issue under the sun. And we don't shy away from any of it. But when I first got involved in this program, I made the statement in front of one of the deans that I've got, we're required to have two office hours a week, and that's fine. But I plan on being available either through email, text message, or telephone whenever they need it. And he said, oh, you can't do that. I said, excuse me? He said, that's just an imposition on your time. I said, you do realize you didn't ask me to do this. I'm saying I want to do it. I have the time because I'm retired, in addition to everything else I do. And it's enjoyable. You're, you're interfacing with these students. You're getting to know them. You're getting to understand them. And they feel a lot more comfortable coming back to you and raising questions. It might be a little bit off topic, but it doesn't matter. And if it requires more than one of us, two or three of us will get on a call, however they want to handle it. And I think it's a it's a great learning experience for them. And it's also a great learning experience for us. Well, that's a great point. It is a great learning experience for us as well. Ken? Yeah, you know, one of the uh, benefits I find of the program is that I, I think we work a lot on trying to break down the silos. Uh, we all have our backgrounds and our specific areas of expertise, but we interact with each other. And, you know, at a senior management level of an insurance company, you need to understand what claims does. You need to understand underwriting. You need to understand legal. You need to understand operations. So, so one of the joys that I have is, you know, I, I teach risk management. And for a lot of people, uh, risk management is something they've never been exposed to before. So it's, it's a completely eye-opening learning experience for them. Uh, other people in the class are actually in a risk management department, but there's areas in risk management they hadn't been exposed to. So uh, the feedback that we get is not only uh, did the students appreciate the technical knowledge that we're providing them, that they're giving them insight to things that they hadn't had before, but you also hear things like, I now have confidence that I could attend a meeting that they're discussing something that I, I'm familiar with. I understand you know, what they're trying to get across. I understand what they're trying to, uh, what, what, you know, what their interest is and in whatever it may be. Uh, and, and that I find fascinating. So. Uh, back to you, Marguerite. Oh, yeah. So one of the things, uh, a couple of students have been saying this, and I really, this the statement that the uh, course that I teach um, is very thought provoking. And that I really love that because one of the, that's what, that's the whole idea to be able to introduce new ideas, new topics. A lot of people, believe it or not, in the industry, if you're a middle manager or even a senior VP or et cetera, you're you know, you don't really know what goes on in the operations side, especially the back office. This is the grunt work. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the folks really work to get the production information into the system so you can get your premium, your claims paid, everything covered. So, um, and I found that a lot of folks are like really love that because it they it's the first time they've really been introduced to it and they're saying you know i never realized what goes on in the back office the support functions and how they interact with the core functions you know the underwriting and, and it's 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 a critical part that's why I, we named it right teresa the backbone of the company because it's all about that and the other thing is too I love our conversations that we have. I'm always available. I know I do work full time, but I do make that time to speak to everybody. And I really enjoy the conversations and the questions that I get. Um, and even during when, when a deliverable is due, 
I'm open to like, if people want me to look at a draft of something to make sure they're going in the right direction, I'm available to look at that. So I'm always checking on things before the deliverable is due to make sure that I can answer, you know, their questions and and and, bear, and look at drafts to make sure they're heading in the right direction. But I, I really enjoy it. The whole idea with discussion prompts and what they come up with, the uh, new ideas that the individuals come up with is unbelievable. I'm learning things right now. That's great. So, you know, I think that, you know, we've, we've gone through a lot of things that hopefully will give you a sense of the community that we're building and not just the academic content that we're delivering to you. And, you know, we deliver it um, with our experience. You know, we're not academics. We, we've all kind of been through these issues before. We've done these things before. So, you know, they're not hypotheticals at all. And, you know, like they all said, which is really valuable, you know, we are here, you know, essentially as your mentors during the program and thereafter. So it's kind of automatically built into to the program itself. So I'd like to take maybe, um, you know, five, five to 10 minutes um, taking questions from anyone who has any questions for any of the panelists that, that we have here today. So feel free to either you know, go off mute and, and ask your question directly, or you can feel free to put it in the chat. So I'm opening it up for discussion. Well, we must have done a great job. Nobody's got a question. Yeah, I see uh, Debbie mentioned that uh, she's a little scared to be honest, but very excited. So uh, you know, yeah. Col Columbia is a top-notch school. And uh, this program is, uh, we realize that it's an investment for everyone taking the program. And we want to live up to that investment. We want to make sure that you're coming away from this program satisfied, that you feel it was well worth the investment uh, for the program. And the feedback that we get is, you know, how it enhances someone's career. Uh, it's not uncommon that, you know, midway through the program or after the program, uh, a lot of our students take new responsibilities. They find different things. And, and it's this program that I think not only gave them the confidence to do that, but enabled them uh, to kind of show that they're kind of leaders uh, in the industry. Yeah, and we support you. We, I mean, we're here to support you through the program with everything, you know, even, even when you're not taking my course or something, you have questions that you want to talk to me about when you're in another, doing another course, we're here to support you all the way through the program and even after. Yeah, so we have a question here. I'm trying to understand the target level of the program. Can you share who you've seen the most gain from in your in your classes? Um, do any of you have any thoughts yeah. about that? So ideally, you know, th this, is an, this is a master's level program. It's not really ideal for someone just finishing their graduate degree. Uh, it's been more beneficial for someone who has a couple years experience uh, mm -hmm. and they've been in the work environment and they're trying to expand it. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, uh, someone who's motivated that they want to do more, that they're looking for more opportunities that they have with work. Uh, now, within that, that's a fairly broad range. You have everything from middle management to senior management to executives. And I think we've had people at all those levels in the program, and each of those levels felt that they were able to move to the next level. Uh, so I think they all got something out of it. I think this program also focuses on practicality. I mean, my biggest complaint in graduate school and even undergraduate was an academic approach to things. And we've, as we find, the real world is radically different than the academic side. So a lot of the the, uh, the projects that you'll come across in these in this course, in these courses, will deal with real life situations. Last time around, we were dealing with climate change, researching it, figuring out what caused it, and more importantly, creating insurance products that can offset or mitigate the damage done by climate change, and also facilitate financing because of the enormous cost associated with anything that we want to do on climate change. Another big issue that's been very trendy is the BI issue with uh, COVID. How do we deal with that? So what I did is I just took a, a quick write up, did a quick write up on what the uh, thought I had. And I took that after to some of this, the uh, other instructors had read through it. And I sent it to Hank Greenberg to get his feel. I sent it to John Doyle to get his position. 
So we've got access to senior people in the industry. We don't always get the answers we want, but watching the students go through and looking at the practical applications of what we're doing gives them a feel that they're not wasting their time. They are really getting into when they're into the situation and they're able to deal with real world situations. Yeah, I just want to address Amanda brought up the question. Uh, Amanda is a, uh, involved in catastrophe modeling. Amanda, I spent a time as the director of catastrophe modeling at AIG. So I understand the time pressure that you have. Uh, when a CAD event happens, you know, you need to run the modeling. You need to, and people are expecting answers, you know, immediately. And it's changing very quickly. Uh, this program is designed for people that are working. All right. Mm -hmm. We understand that you have to have a balance between, you, you know, you're not a full time student. You have other responsibilities. And what we do is we try to accommodate you as best you can. Now, how do we do that? One, when a program starts, you'll get a syllabus for the whole year. So you'll you'll see every single assignment that's available. You can uh, read things in advance. You can prepare yourself. If there's something that comes up, we're all you know, we, we've all worked in the industry. We understand that that happens. And I think we try to accommodate you as best we can. So, uh, you, you know, I, I would I would just say that, you know, we understand that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, th th there is a certain expectation of work that is required of you, but I think we could be accommodating and making sure that it can fit in with your schedule. Right. And, then, you know, the thing is, too, is look, as long as you communicate things to us, we'll work with you again. Right. If there's issues or something and something comes up. You know, one thing that's really interesting that someone brought up is whether or not they'll have the opportunity to network with professionals from different areas of insurance and talk about their personal experience in those, niche, in those niches. That's a fabulous question, because I want you to know that outside of our in addition to our lecturers, every single one of our guest lecturers are open to our students reaching out to them on a professional level or otherwise, to ask them about the guest lecture that they did for the lecturer, to ask them about their specialty. So you are absolutely welcome to do that. And between the 10 classes that we have, we have over 50 people who are involved in you know, all the different areas to, um, to speak to you about anything that you may want. And just keep in mind that those 50 people, the 10 lecturers, we all have hundreds of people within our respective um, Rolodexes, for those of you who know what a Rolodex is, um, you know, it, you know, and and basically, if we don't have the answer between us, we'll probably know somebody with the answer. So you should absolutely feel free and think about the fact that this program is a gateway to some instant networking. And in fact, during orientation, if I see that there are students who haven't already linked in with me or with my lecturers, I ask them, what are you waiting for? And I'll give them a minute to go and, you know, send a link invitation to all of us. But that, again, goes to, you know, that, that community that we're building. Um, is there anything that we can do to jumpstart? As Ken mentioned, usually our courses open a week before they officially open, and you will generally have access to, you know, if, if not the entire course, you will have access to at least several weeks of it. So you can actually look ahead, get ahead, read ahead. We do want to make sure though, that our students don't get too much ahead on the actual assignments because we want the students to feed off each other, to build on their thoughts with each other. And so we kind of, we, we do try to control the um, activities to some extent to make sure that everyone is learning at the same pace. We do not want this to be an online program where somebody could just breeze through it and then be done with it in a month. We really want our cohort to learn together, to move together, um, and, and to learn together. Great. Um, does anyone have any other? I think we covered all the questions in the chat. But if you have any other questions, we're, we're living up to what we're, we're saying here. Please feel free to email any of us. Um, email me, Chrissy, uh, your admissions counselor, Bob, Ken, Marguerite. Um, and we'll be glad to, to take your questions. Um, and, you know, I've had some conversations with some of you one-on-one. -on -one. You can feel free to do that with any of us as well. So um, with that, I'm going to- Well, there's another your, question. I, oh, there's another one popped up. What is it? Um, the access to each of you is very promising. Do you see that? It just came yes. up. Can you expand on how your group projects work with the asynchronous approach? So asynchronous learning is just that. 
So basically all of our reading material, all of our lectures, as Ken mentioned, are pre-recorded and you get to watch them once, you get to watch them 10 times on your own time. We have students who are watching the lectures while they're waiting for their kids to finish soccer practice. We have you know, people who are doing it during lunchtime. So all of that is very flexible in terms of the learning part of it. It is more synchronous actually with respect to group work where we allow the students and we don't mandate when they do it. We allow the students just as they would in work arrange convenient times where they can all meet in order to work on their projects. Our student groups are usually no more than five people per group to make it a little bit easier for you to manage. And we also take into account the fact that our students come from different time zones. However, because we want everyone to have the experience with each other, we are not going to just lump every one from the East Coast with the East Coast right. because we want our students to really get to know each other. And that's also a function of your jobs. Most of you work for multinational companies and you know, you know what it takes to you know, work with people who are overseas. So that's also part of the dynamic. So see this as kind of like an extension of your workplace, right? The things that you're accustomed to doing for work will be similar to the things that you do with us. Yeah, one other comment on the group projects. So the group projects that I have are fairly challenging and very few, if any person would be able to complete a group project based upon their own experience and their own knowledge. The group project is, is designed to get people with different backgrounds and different uh, perspectives to contribute. And you really need that. And, and again, it, it's designed to show how do you work together with people with different backgrounds, uh, maybe different interests uh, on, on a certain task. And we, and we do spend a fair amount of time on that. You know, and you go through that whole thing with group projects too, I'm sure. Some of you may know about the whole process of teamwork, forming, storming, norming, performing. Uh, this happens, and we and they actually the teams work through it, and they work through it very well. And uh, the other thing is too, I wanted to mention is uh, what teams do. They pick a lead because we I have a lot of group activities in, in my course. Uh, they pick a lead to go to the office hours when they're you know based on availability and have all the questions from the team. So they don't all have to come at once, right? So they have somebody that would come in and represent them and report it back to the team. So that's, I found very helpful. In the, in the, and actually in the last three cohorts, that's how a lot of people have done and ran their teams. Great. Well, I'd like to um, you know, go through our usual information session as well, but first let me thank Bob, Ken, and Marguerite for coming to our program today. Um, and again, if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out.